Hare Krishna. So, <clears throat> we all have probably experienced some people who are evil. Evil means that some people like to cause suffering for the purpose of causing suffering. So, there is in the world purposeful suffering and purposeless suffering. Say if a doctor gives an injection to a child, it's, it's pain, but it is purposeful, it serves some purpose. But we have the example of the hunter Brugari. As a hunter, he was going to kill animals. But what was he doing? Half killing them. So prolonging the pain. So to cause suffering for the purpose of causing suffering, for no other purpose beyond that, that is evil. And Either we ourselves might have been targeted by someone like that and it can be very, very alarming when we meet someone like that, especially if you become the target of someone like that. What did I do to trouble you? But even if that doesn't happen, we probably have heard, you know, there can be terrorists, there can be sociopaths, there can be psychopaths. So sometimes we may start thinking that our, our people innately bad what do you think are people innately bad no are people innately good yes okay are some people innately bad yes yeah. <laughs> you know it's a it's our heart would like to say no no nobody is innately bad but sometimes we do experience some people just keep doing terrible things and there is not even any remorse in them. And sometimes they delight in doing terrible things. And then we may start thinking, is it that some people are made differently from other people? And then we would like to, as I said, we all like, like to believe that people are basically good. But when we meet people who are not so good, let's to put it mildly again, then we start questioning what's going on. So broadly, we can have two approaches. Say a child, and a child is newborn, because the child is naive. The child does not have any capacity to doubt. And the mother offers a breast milk, the child just suckles it and drinks. And the child doesn't the child starts doubting, who is this person? What is she giving me? The child couldn't survive. So there is childishness and there is childlikeness. So childish is basically naive, frivolous. So if we have a naive approach towards people, so children, they might just naively trust anyone. That, that's why if a kidnapper comes along and offers some sweets, offers some toys, and a child might just go away with them. And if somebody is naive, they can be exploited. They can be ruined by someone who is wicked, who is exploitative. So, in dealing with people, na being naive is one extreme. And sometimes, when we have bad experiences with people, from naive, we might go to the other extreme of cynicism. Naivety, naive, naive is, oh, everybody is good. Cynicism is, nobody is good. In America, I was going for a program, and I saw on the bumper of a car ahead of me, uh, the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> so, what has happened here, people might just feel, oh, people are terrible. So, cynicism is the other extreme, where we just see everyone negatively, everyone suspiciously. But, cynicism, we might say, it might keep me safe. I won't be betrayed by anyone, I won't be let down by anyone. But then, Cynicism will also keep us safe, but safely lonely. We want relationships. So in between these two extremes, naivety and cynicism, between these two is the courage to trust. So we all need to trust. But that trust is again not uh, uninformed, it is not cowardly, it is not naive. 
it has to be it is a intelligent act of courage trusting anyone requires courage because of course it doesn't require courage if we have no experience of the real world but especially uh, if you if we want to interact on a close basis with someone we require the courage to trust so now how do we how do we not be naive at the same time not be cynical for that we need to understand how people work so this applies in every area of life it applies in say within professions we need some level of trust if we are professionally dealing with someone there is no trust there cannot be any relationship and online selling started say ebay or something like that if there had been no basic denominator of trust uh, the seller is in one part of the world the purchaser is one part of the world the seller can send a product which is flawed and the buyer can send a check which is going to bounce and if that had happened the whole e-commerce would have collapsed but there's a basic level of trust so although in business in profession we have laws and we have insurances and everything but still without trust we cannot function and this applies all the more so in our personal relationships and similarly if you want to practice spiritual life those who are our spiritual friends spiritual guides a trust is required over there and the trust requires some courage so that courage how do we develop that for that we need to understand human nature and for this broadly speaking we could say there are two theories of human nature now whenever we talk about human nature it's a big subject and theories are also generalizations uh, but there is one theory which is you could say the uh, leftist theory the left is the, the the broadly the communist kind of narrative the left narrative is that people are innately good it is their situations that makes them bad so in, in that's why communism focus a lot on what they call as social engineering nowadays social justice is a big uh, thing in today's world the idea is oh if somebody is behaving badly that's because their social situations are bad just see how poor they are just see how much exploited they are what do you expect people will do if they are so much poor and exploited they will react so some people for example say if some become like some people become um, extremists some people become terrorists they try to ascribe the cause of this terrorism just see how they were exploited how they were disrespected how they were deprived and this is an understandable reaction so this is the idea that people are basically good and it is the situation that makes them bad so if i'm not sure that's better bro <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Okay So this is one one theory people are innately good but situations make them bad and if we adjust the situations we do social engineering we bring about social justice and people's innate goodness will start manifesting now to some extent it is true that bad situations can make people do terrible things but sometimes we can't ascribe everything to situations when there was this <clears throat> recently there was a attack of terrorist islamic extremists in sri lanka so normally the ex uh, explanation is given these people are so poor these people are so deprived disrespected that they cannot do that <coughs> most of the people who orchestrated that terrorist attack they were all well educated from wealthy families in fact most of them had degrees from uk and europe and if you see many of the leaders of terrorists they are very well educated people so it's not just and they are not necessarily from deprived situations some of them may be but not all of them so we we all can hear no in we all probably know have heard inspiring stories of some people who might have been born in very terrible situations but they rise above those situations and they have grown up to be responsible successful people so it's not that 
we can with our evidence we can say that with our observation the knowledge that situations alone don't determine people so sometimes bad situations can also create lead to people becoming good and sometimes good situations can also lead to people becoming bad and in fact it is um, complex because generally if you consider if immigrants come to the western world say indians chinese if this has been done in america maybe it's applying broadly in the uk also that if somebody a as an immigrant comes to the west then they or their children they are way above say asian children outperform their american peers much much uh, by many degrees basically and that's why if the ivy league universities in america if they were purely based on merit they would be filled with asians that's why they have something called a diversity quota and that's why say a very meritorious asian student might not get in but a uh, much less meritorious latino might get in it's not a discrimination but it, that they call it diversity and inclusion the point i'm making is it seems that the, the immigrants when they come they have they outperform their american peers but as they live on within three generations this difference disappears if for three generations a particular family has lived then those uh, asian kids they are just like the americans so this indicates that a certain amount of deprivation is conducive for motivation that when somebody has come from a different country they have left everything and they have come we have to make it so that motivation is high now we, we so that now what amount of deprivation is optimal for motivation that's something open to question but it's not always that a deprived social situation will lead to a poor achievement and it doesn't seem to that if somebody is abandoned provisions that doesn't necessarily mean they will be they will work very powerfully so this is so the one theory i talked about is this people are socially determined that doesn't seem to be true it's not that it's untrue but it's not the complete truth the other theory could be that people are innately bad now nobody would directly say that people are innately bad but the idea is say for example in christianity uh, we all are said to have come from the one adam who who committed the original sin and because of that sin is passed down like a genetic defect among people and so their attitude is that without the intercessionary intercessionary means coming in between intercessionary grace of jesus we are all innately sinful and we are all <coughs> hellbound so and they say there's so much evil in the world we cannot deny that there are people who are evil and they do terrible things <clears throat> in the 20th century itself millions and millions of people were killed in wars and uh, genocides so their idea is that people are innately evil and unless they are spiritually saved they will act in evil ways now of course not all christians may equally subscribe to this belief even christians also they accept that we are we are made in the image of god so you could say that we are basically good but all the human beings all who are here because they are the descendants of jesus they this is of adam adam so they are all innately sinful now this also doesn't uh, it, it doesn't match with the evidence you could say that some people might be atheists and they might be very good people they might be moral they might be kind they might be charitable and some people might be these believers supposedly but they might uh, their conduct might be such that it will shake our faith in god and religion in fact i saw in my as in traveling in texas so one person had a slogan on their car oh god please save me from your preachers <laughs> <laughs> now normally god saves us through his preachers but if the preachers are self righteous holier than thou condescending hell and brimstone kind people say i just don't want anything to do with these people 
So, uh, we see that mere religious affiliation doesn't determine people's behavior. So, if people are innately bad, then why are people who are even atheists sometimes good? Or people who are not religious are also good? So, <clears throat> to retrace what I've discussed till now, first we talked about two attitudes, cynicism and naivety. And then we want to have the courage to trust so that we can move forward in life. But to have that courage, we need to understand human nature. We talked about two broad ideas. Are people innately good or people are innately bad? So now the, the Gita understanding is, is a composite. It says that when we talk about innate, there are two levels of innateness. Because the self is three level. There's the body, the mind and the soul. So when we're talking about innate, we could be talking about the soul or we could be talking about the mind. Now at the level of the soul, Krishna says that all living beings are my parts. And because Krishna is God, so we can say every soul is godly. So at the level of the soul, we could say everybody is innately good. But there's another level of innateness is the mind. Now, each of us has different kinds of impressions in the mind. And the broad categorization that the uh, Gita uses is the three modes of material nature. So now some people, based on the kind of impressions that are there in their mind, they may they may act virtuously and some may act viciously. If parents have many children, can now see that each child has their own personality. Some children from their just childhood maybe very babyhood also they're like silent and gentle. Some child babies when they cry, it's like they cry in a way they want to bring the whole roof down. Even in their cribs, they are looking out and thinking, when will I take control of the house? Mm -hmm. So, there, is, there are something which are innate characteristics. Now, these are not characteristics necessarily of the soul. They are characteristics of the mind. So now, Krishna uses the word Bhagavad Gita in the Bhagavad Gita, Jatasya. There is the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Does anyone know which is that chapter? 16th chapter? Yeah, thank you. The divine and demoniac nature. So there, if I put it this way, there are two kinds of people. Some are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> so, Dvaubhuta Sargao Lokesmin Daiva Asura Evacha Krishna says, there are, the wise are the godly, the unwise are the ungodly. But significantly, what Krishna says is, Abhijatasya Bharata, from 16, 1 to 3, he gives the characteristics of those who are Godly. And 16.4, he used the characters of those who are ungodly. Dambho darpo bhimanascha krodhak parusya mevacha agyanam cha bhijatasya partha sampadamasurim. So, he talks about abhijatasya. And people are born with these characteristics. Now, where are they born? What do we mean they are born with? It's not that the soul has these characteristics. It's rather when the soul goes from one body to another, it goes with the subtle body. So I am using the mind as a shorthand for referring the subtle body, just to keep things simple. The mind, so the mind goes with the soul. So depending on how a particular person has lived in the past, they will have a particular nature. So some people might be ungodly, some people might be godly. Of course, most of us will be somewhere on a spectrum between the two. But so at an innate level, in terms of the mind, we have different levels of godliness and ungodliness. And the mind, in general, gravitates downwards. It's far easier to make people stupider than to make them smarter. Isn't it? So that's why, why? because gravity pulls down. So the mind even if somebody has good impressions in the mind, the mind can very easily get degraded downwards. So now, if you consider these two levels of innateness, there's the innateness means we can refer to the soul or innateness we can refer to the mind. 
so what determines our behavior are people innately good or innately bad at the level of the soul everyone is innately good but at the level of the mind it depends on what kind of impressions people have and these impressions can be from various factors it can be from their previous life actions it can be from their this life upbringing it can be from their association so upbringing and association is what the communists would call as social determinism hmm? uh, that we are socially determined and when when those people say christians say some people are innately evil and we see some people are innately this they, they seem to be violent they seem to be disagreeable that innateness is from the previous life it's not from innate to the soul so basically both these ideas can be reconciled with this understanding of two levels of innateness and in this so will people if people are left to themselves if everybody is say put in a situation which is which is not deprived which is reasonably socially they are in a comfortable situation so will they become good human beings it depends so you could say that all of us have a potential for virtue from the soul because the soul is innately innately good so there is a potential for virtue but depending on the kind of impressions in the mind we all have a propensity for vice the two things the potential for virtue comes from the soul the propensity for vice comes from the mind the propensity for vice means the propensity for lust for greed for anger for envy all this comes from the mind now the potential for virtue that is there in the soul may not manifest automatically if left to their mean, own means people may not necessarily be good it depends on how well the potential for virtue fights against the propensity for vice and emerges forth so we could say everybody has the rather than so we could modify the statement based on this understanding that it's not saying everybody is innately good everybody has the innate potential to be good but whether they will act good whether that potential will manifest even in this lifetime that depends on whether they just go along with the propensities of the mind or they nourish and develop the potential of the soul so this is the basic you could say topography of the inner world that is we can draw from the gita that are pe that people if you want to understand how people behave you have to understand this multi level a propensity for vice a potential for virtue and if individually and socially so individually a person tries to develop their potential for virtue and socially the socio social cultural environment nourishes that potential for virtue then their goodness will manifest but otherwise they may well gravitate towards their vice and thus they may act in ways that hurt them and hurt others so any comments or questions at this point yes please okay good question so is it our responsibility to develop a society which encourages which helps people's virtue to manifest potential for virtue yes of course definitely see broadly speaking what do we mean by human culture we might refer to the way people dress the what people eat the language that people speak the kind of houses they have we may talk of all this as human culture and that's true at one level but if we use a unlikely parallel if you say there's a bacteria culture now what does it mean it means it's a biochemical environment where bacteria will flourish so by analogy we could say human culture is that culture where people's humanity flourishes so it's not just that any anything that humans do you can call it as culture in one sense you now okay these people live like this these people live like that that's their culture but in another sense we could say is 
culture as that which fosters people's humane characteristics. It fosters their humanity. And in many ways, we might say that most many human cultures today and maybe in the, in the past, they were not always fostering people's humanity. If we consider <clears throat> everybody has the propensity for vice and that needs to be checked. Now one check of course is the law and order system in the world. But okay, if you do wrong, you will be punished. Voltaire <clears throat> was I believe a French, a French thinker. He was quite atheistic. Bertrand Rousseau was also a prominent atheist about 200 years ago. Now both of them, they would talk when they would talk about atheism, they would talk about it with their friends in closed doors. And they they both believed atheism, they, atheism, they wanted to propagate atheism, but they didn't want their servants to hear about atheism. They thought if the servants believe in God, they won't steal the silver from my house. <laughs> so the point, point I'm using for this is that I'm using this example that you can have a law and order which puts fear that everybody needs some amount of deterrent. The propensity for vice, it can be it can be dealt with or regulated different ways. One is at the level of fear. Or if I indulge in this, there'll be problems. So one fear could be that the police will punish me. But another, you could say more pervasive fear is the fear of God. In fact, the fear that God is watching all my actions and that I am accountable to him, that fear is one is the greatest civilizing force in humanity. The fear that God is watching me, that the fear that I am accountable to God, it is the, not just one of the, but the greatest civilizing force. Because ultimately, how much can social law and order control? And for many people, they think that, what is that? I saw a cartoon which says that a person was caught for speeding. And the cop says, didn't you see the speed limit? He says, yes, I saw the speed limit. I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so what that means is that many people think that doing wrong is not the problem. Getting caught while doing wrong is the problem. So now if people start living like that, I said earlier that trust is very essential for relationships. Trust is essential in every walk of life, not just in personal life, professional life, everywhere. So now how do you create that trust? How do you make people behave in trustworthy ways? One is, if you behave in untrustworthy ways, you will be punished by the law. But a much bigger thing is, much more pervasive effect could be that if you do wrong, you will be punished by God. And in fact, <clears throat> if you, uh, in Europe there was a Greco-Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire by the 4th, 5th century started collapsing. And one reason was there was pervasive immorality. And at that time, the Roman Emperor, he looked around and he said that even for basic administration of society, that, uh, for material administration of society also, people need to be honest. So he said, who are the honest people over here? And he saw the Christians over there were honest. Till that time, Christians were quite highly persecuted. But then he adopted Christianity. So it was the pagan Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire at that time. And then after that, the after that, what happened was Christianity spread in the very big. But ironically, the way Christians were persecuted by other by existing faiths at that time, as soon as Christians gained power, they started persecuting the other faiths also. That is unfortunate. But the point I'm making over here is that even for material administration, morality, for material um, administration, a basic level of morality in society is required. 
and it was found by the Roman Emperor who had no interest in Christianity per se. For utilitarian purposes, he felt that this fear of God is good, which people have because of which they are honest. That is good. So, so when we say that, that to answer your come to your specific answer to your question, that is it our responsibility? Yes. But what do we do? At one level, you say we can, we say that we have to have better law and order. But how much? Sometimes, how many police can you have in a society? And sometimes, if the police do something corrupt, do you have police to police the police? But without moral, basic morality, nothing can function in society. So, fostering God consciousness uh, at the very level, at the basic level of fear. Of course, we can go higher and we'll talk about in the course as we move forward, how we can go higher. But at that basic level, the fear of God is required. Now, by the 18th, 19th centuries, 1920, you could say roughly, uh, as scientific rationality started spreading and Darwinian evolution and other theories started getting propagated, so people started feeling that belief in God is no longer rational. There was the German thinker, Friedrich Nietzsche, he said that God is dead. Now, sometimes he is given as an emblem of atheism. And his proclamation, God is dead. But the way he spoke it, it was not, he, in the, if you, the novel, in the story in which he writes this, it's not a celebratory occasion. He says that, oh, we, God is dead, who has killed him? He said, we have killed him. And if we have killed him, then all the water in the world is not enough to wash the stain of the blood of this terrible murder that we have committed. And now that God is dead, the earth has no center and everything is spinning apart. So basically, what he, he, he saw that as a, a, a very dangerous thing. That the removal of that, if God is not there, and obviously the fear of God is also not there. Then if the fear of God is not there, then what will be the civilizing force in society? So he said, we human beings have to evolve. We have to become like superhuman beings. And then we will create our own morality. But that has not worked very well. We have almost, uh, just in the last century, you know, in the 20th century, the number of people who were killed in wars were seven times more than the number of people killed in wars from the 1st to the 19th century combined together. So, it's been a brutal century. Although we, our historical memory often tends to be very short and we may not remember, but it's been... So, what do we do? At one level, people feel that now there's a lot of moral relativism. Okay, that's what you believe is right, that's what I believe is right. But we cannot live as a society like that. So now representing God as a rational, rationally intelligible and as a spiritually experienceable reality. That is what is required. So of course fear of God is the basic level. Beyond that we can go toward love of God also and that's desirable. But yes, so we need better law enforcement but that will only deter people from, to some extent from their propensity for vice. But it is positive God. Now, I talk with respect to God, you can have fear of God, you can have love for God. If we consider these two things, there's a propensity for vice and there's a potential for virtue. So the propensity for vice can be curbed by the fear of God. But the potential for virtue can be manifested only by love for God. So that's why what we need to do is if you look at Srila Prabhupada's presentations, it was not so much, he did not talk about, although there is a fifth canto, there is a description of hell. Prabhupada hardly ever talks about that in his classes. Although some of the disciples of Prabhupada made that quite prominent by publishing a book called Laws of Nature in which they put those pictures on the cover pages. But even in the book Laws of Nature, Prabhupada's emphasis is not so much on, oh, you will suffer all this hellish punishment, so don't, don't go do that. It's more a rational presentation, actually, Worldly pleasures are not all that they are made out to be. You are meant for something better than worldly pleasures. And therefore pursue transcendence. So Prabhupada's approach was, 
Yes, he did caution us quite often about not giving into the propensity for vice. But his focus was on developing the potential for virtue. So the propensity for vice can be curbed by fear of God, but the potential for virtue can be fanned, can be nourished by love for God. So to the extent we can foster God consciousness in both ways, fear of God and love for God, to that extent we can have a greater civilizing effect on the individual co coming not just from the individual willpower but also from the social influence. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yes, true. Yeah. How does Varanashram come into this picture? Mm, two, three things. The first point is that everybody has to earn a living. To survive in the world, everybody has to work. Na karmana mana rambhan. Sharid yatra pichate na prasiddheda karmana. 3.8 Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that. You cannot even survive if you don't work. So, now how best to engage people in a way that is two things that is contributed to society and that is conducive for their spiritual growth so we have a body we have a body mind mechanism and we have the soul so when we live in the world we need to live harmoniously at the same time we also need to progress beyond the world through our consciousness so if the body mind their nature is understood now when we talk about the mind i am talking right now initially till now talk about the propensities in terms of propensity for vice but it's not only those propensities that are there we all have a particular innate nature so some people might be more intellectual some people might be more martial some people might be more mercantile some people might be more mechanical so that is the basically the four human types. So the four Varanas, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, they are also impressions in the mind, the subtle body. So now, if somebody can be engaged in a way that is harmonious with their nature, then they can also contribute to society. So basically, how do we know our nature? Uh, there's two things. If Guna Karma Vibhagasha, Guna is quality, karma is activity. So we, we, we could understand it in today's world is Guna is comfort, karma is competence. That means if we are doing something and we feel comfortable doing that and we are competent doing that, we feel good about doing it and we are actually good doing it. We can do it well. Then that's a broad indication that this activity is aligned with our nature. So what happens by this is that there is there are two things. There is social contribution that will come and there will also be personal satisfaction that will come. Because if I am doing something which I feel good about, then that will give me personal satisfaction also. And the spiritual journey itself will give us spiritual satisfaction. But often that satisfaction is not so easily available. So you could say that there is there are worldly pleasures that are anti-spiritual. And there are spiritual pleasures. So we, to some extent, the spiritual journey is we give up the worldly pleasures and go towards spiritual pleasures. But this is a long journey. And in between, are we to live pleasureless? We can say, no, no, we can get some spiritual taste also. Yes, we can, but how much? That often is elusive. It's, it's, it sometimes comes, it doesn't come. So if we could be engaged in a way that is according to our nature, not just according to our material nature, but also according to our spiritual purpose. That means Brahmanas love to study. So if a Brahmana is told to do fundraising, they will be miserable. But if a Brahmana studies, but a Brahmana studies books on atheism and become, propagates atheism, that's also not good. So we want to do something which is in harmony with our material nature, but it is also in harmony with our spiritual purpose. So if we do that, then what will happen? As somebody is going from this journey here to here, from giving up worldly anti-spiritual anti, anti pleasures to 
getting spiritual pleasure, which comes by purification and absorption in Krishna. Along the journey, they can get material pleasure, which is higher, which is not just sensual. Material pleasure that is in harmony, that comes from living in harmony with their nature. And this pleasure would actually be a combination of the material and spiritual. Because at just so for the intellectual, just to read an intellectually satisfying book is intellectually stimulating book is satisfying. But for an intellectual to read a book which is intellectually stimulating as well as this devotionally illuminating, which makes them go closer to Krishna also. Then what happens? The, they get some intermediate satisfaction, which is a combination of material and spiritual. And that can help the person uh, per persevere through this journey. So most people who falter on that journey from worldly pleasure, only anti-materials, anti-spiritual pleasures to spiritual pleasures, they falter because the, it's the, the lack of pleasure seems to be there for too long. So Varanashram provides a structure by which people can, three things now happen. There is social contribution that happens because they are doing something which they are good at. Personal satisfaction comes up because they are doing something according to nature. And spiritual evolution also happens because they are doing it in connection with the, with the Supreme. So now how exactly to do all this in today's world? Uh, the point is not so much to divide people into society, into boxes. You know, you are a Brahmana, you are a Kshatriya. In some parts of the world, in some of the Gurukuls, we tried that. You know, some devotee children were told, you are a Brahmana. And you do this Chanda Mahantra, you are a Vaishya. But it's not that simple. It's not so easy to identify people. And later on, as they grew up, they realized they are not that. And they felt quite unhappy about the way the childhood went. So it's not so easy that you can identify people's varanas. But broadly, we could do is, instead of categorizing people into varanas, we could just broadly identify activities which are harmonious with us and pursue those activities. So we don't need particularly the categorization in terms of the label. We just need the identification of activities that we can happily do. And if we could engage devotees accordingly, and, and later on even people accordingly, then they are less likely to re relapse towards anti-spiritual pressures. And that's how they can progress. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, please. Okay, so what is spiritual satisfaction? Basically, as I said, there are three levels of reality. There's the body, the mind and the soul. The soul by nature is, is said to be joyful. Sat, Chit, Ananda. The soul is eternal, the soul is conscious and the soul is joyful. However, presently, the soul's consciousness is caught in many material things. And that's why the soul is not able to experience one's innate joyfulness. It's like a child is sitting comfortably at home. Maybe the mother is nearby and the home is quite comfortable. But the child is watching a horror movie. And the consciousness is completely projected into the horror movie. Because of that, the child just, maybe sometimes horror, fear, terror, panic, all those emotions is going through. So, so similarly for us, Purusha Prakriti Sthohi Bhungte Prakriti Jan Gunan Karanam Guna Sangosya Sada Sad Yoni Janmasu That the soul's consciousness is caught in matter. And based on what kind of movie is there, the, so the child experiences emotions. So similarly, based on what kind of events are happening for us in the material world, we experience pleasure and pain. But beyond all this, at the level of the soul itself, there is innate joyfulness. So to the extent our consciousness arises to the spiritual level, to the extent we connect with anything spiritual, to the extent slowly an awareness of our innate nature, innate joyfulness starts becoming activated. So for example, if you come to a temple and participate in some spiritual music, some kirtan, and then feel some joy, some peace, or we sit and do some meditation, chant some mantras and feel some peace. So what is happening over there is, 
currently our consciousness is projected from the so soul is here the mind is here the body is here so you could say soul is soul is the observer of the movie like the child the mind is like the screen and the physical reality is what is whatever is being depicted on the movie so sometimes in life good things happen to us it's like the movie is going on very nicely there's a lot of enjoyment we feel happy sometimes the movie horrible things happen and we feel miserable but we are so caught in the movie that we just can't perceive anything beyond the movie so what happens for helping us to realize our spirituality because we are so caught in the movie uh, krishna arranges the whole process of bhakti yoga is spiritual stimuli are provided us to us at the material level that means say the mantra now it is a spiritual sound but it's arranged such a way that it manifests through our material throat so the same throat which i can produce and other sounds i produce this sound also but because this sound is connected with god it's the names of god and he has invested his personal potency in them so it starts stimulating our spiritual memory it starts stimulating our spiritual awareness and then that's how with some spiritual whenever we expose ourselves to spiritual stimuli we experience some peace some joy and as we start awakening more and more we start experiencing this more and more so spiritual satisfaction is that satisfaction which we experience uh because of activation of our spiritual awareness which usually happens through connection with some spiritual stimuli so it's largely inner happiness some spiritual stimulus might be there but it's largely it's not in, it's not dependent on the worldly sources of happiness so if we are if we are spiritually absorbed say now a few days later the janmashtami is the appearance in krishna it is krishna's birthday so many devotees fast at that time now fasting is you could say the state of physical deprivation but if we are absorbed in krishna maybe doing some surveys hearing some some stories of krishna hearing some wisdom maybe participating some kirtan even in that material deprivation because of that spiritual absorption there is some special sublime happiness and that indicates that actually in this situation i sh i should be feeling tormented but i'm not feeling tormented that means i'm experiencing something which is separate from the body something which is at a trans physical level and that spiritual happiness and as our contact with our own spirituality or our contact with the supreme spiritual reality krishna as it increases more and more we start experiencing more and more spiritual happiness okay thank you so a basic question yeah what's the spirituality okay what is spirituality material yeah so spirituality can mean broadly three things it is a level of reality it is a state of mind and it is a process for attaining that level of reality and state of mind i'll repeat these three things okay. that most people when they think something is spiritual oh i went to that place it was so spiritual mm -hmm. what they mean is it made me feel so good i felt relaxed i felt at peace i felt like one with the cosmos so for most people spiritual is a state of mind I, I felt spiritual. Now, yes, spiritual is a state of mind, but it's not only that. Spiritual is also a level of reality. Level of reality means that reality itself has two broad categories. There is matter and there is spirit. So, matter, if you see from the pure physical perspective, this mic stand is made of the same essential atoms of fundamental particles as, say, my hand. but it is not conscious i am conscious so this consciousness does not come from matter so there is another level of reality that that level of reality is spiritual spiritual level of reality so now <coughs> our consciousness if it is at the material level then like like a person like the child watching the movie or movie getting absorbed in it so if our consciousness is at the material level 
we experience everything in terms of matter and sometimes pleasure sometimes pain gradually as we grow older life becomes tougher uh, the, the pain becomes much more than the pleasure but as we move forward from the material level towards the spiritual level that means we raise our consciousness then we start experiencing our spirituality more and more and that state of mind which we call the spiritual when our consciousness rises to the spiritual level of reality if you consider a mountain the top of the mountain is spirituality spiritual level of consciousness spiritual reality and bottom of the mountain is material level of reality material consciousness so if we are at the bottom of the mountain we experience everything in terms of matter but if we rise up to the spiritual level then we experience the joy the sublime uh, experiences that we have so basically process. that process is also called as spirituality so now that means three things spirituality is a state of mind which is the most common understanding of people as spirituality spirituality is also a level of reality which if we attain we get the state of mind and spirituality is also the process that we follow by which we attain that level of reality okay thank you there's one more question here yes bro दुर्योधन who is the main villain in the <coughs> mahabharat and then we we'll contrast his character with that of yudhishthir and then i'll talk about arjun and i'll contrast his character with karna and we'll see how it works so basically we can talk about a spectrum there is good and bad virtue and vice so some people are more situated towards the virtuous side some people are situated towards the more to the wish side of vice so now duryodhan when he was born the mahabharat describes that there were many inauspicious signs there were jackals were howling at that time there were donkeys that were braying and there were a lot of natural upheavals that happened when krishna appears nature was very auspicious at that time but here nature was very inauspicious so he was born to the blind king dhritarashtra and when he was born at that time his wife gandhari had the benediction that she would have 100 sons there was gandhari um, dhritarashtra and pandu were brothers and <clears throat> gandhari had not had a child for a long time and pandu had also not had children but then somehow pandu had a child first so that child was yudhishthir then duryodhan was born now when duryodhan was born the pandu and yudhishthir they had a third friend third brother third brother half brother who was vidura vidura was very wise so vidura said that this child there is so much inauspiciousness at his birth He says, "Abandon this child. If this child gets royal privilege, gets royal power, he will become totally. He will ruin society. He will ruin, uh, ruin the uh, dynasty, ruin the kingdom." Now, this is quite a uh, serious demand to make to someone. you know the child is born and tell them to abandon the child how can you do that 
Now, of course, sometimes uh, some parents may be poor and they might put the child for adop adoption or sometimes so if somebody has given birth to a child outside marriage or something, they might put the child for adoption. Sometimes parents do abandon their child. It's not normal, but it does happen. So now in this case, Rutrashtra said, he's my son. How can I abandon him? Now his emotion was understandable entirely. But at the same time, it was not responsible. Why? Because he was not just a father. He was also the king. And he has a responsibility to take care of his children, but he also has to take responsibility to take care of the whole society. And therefore, now when Vidura said, abandon the child, what did that mean? Now, he, that child, it's not that the child shouldn't live. What Vidura was telling is that he needn't grow up to be the royal heir. Because like earlier I said that you know, if more comfort comes, the more people's innate toughness goes down. Basically, everybody has virtue and vice within them and actually the more outer power we get, the more inner power we need. It's a very important principle. The more outer power we get, the more inner power we need. Say for example, uh, somebody is given a machine gun. Now, they need a lot of inner power, a lot of self-control, so that during just a casual dispute, casual altercation, they just don't take out the machine gun and shoot someone. The machine gun is an extremely dangerous weapon. So the more outer power we get, the more inner power we need. And if there is outer power without inner power, that is a recipe for disaster. It is a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, in some ways, through technology, that is what is happening today. That technology is a great power. And you could say technology is value neutral. On the internet, one can search for spirituality. One can search for obscenity also. Uh, one can search for how to give charity and one can do a Google search to find how to how to commit murder. You can search for everything over there. So technology you could say is value neutral. But basically everybody has this, as I talked about this, potential for goodness is there, potential, but everybody has a propensity for vice also. And if one does not have the inner power to curb the potential for propensity for vice, then that can come out very powerfully, very dreadfully, when there is greater outer power available. So the, the more outer power we have, the more inner power we need. So here when Vidura told Dhritarashtra that abandon your son, it is not that you have to, it's not that he has to die, but don't, he, he is, from the signs itself, from the birth signs, whatever signs he got, he recognized that he has a lot of vice within him. And if that vice basically means lack of inner power, the vice is very strong. If that lack of inner power is coupled with abundance of outer power, that will lead to disaster. So he said, abandon your child. The Thrasha said, no, he's my son. How can I abandon him? Then Vidura said, actually, you have 99 other sons. I'm not telling you to abandon any of them. The, 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 often we put the, all the Kauravas together and we say that the, the Kauravas are evil, Pandavas are good. Well, at one level it is true, not all the Kauravas were equally bad. It was Duryodhana who was evil and all the Kauravas followed him. And that's how they all acted in evil ways. If Duryodhana had been removed from the top, then all the other Kauravas were not that evil. So what he told him is, you will still have 99 sons, just abandon him. But Dhritarashtra was too attached. He said, I cannot give up this son. And thus Duryodhana grew up to be the heir. Now, if you see in today's world also, many people, 
they want to give for their children all the benefits that they didn't have and that's a natural desire i don't want my child to miss out on the good things of life but at one level too much comfort can pamper children so the trashtra he not only not only kept the son but he also pampered him it is for son a natural love was there and as he grew up so basically now these signs that were that occurred when he was born those signs indicate that there was a strong propensity for vice within him and with that propensity for vice as he grew up he grew up to be a very pampered prince naturally he was the the pandu at that time was living in the forest and whether his son would come back or not was also not known so it was expected that he will become the duryodhan will become the king so everybody paid a lot of attention to him everybody offered him respect and he grew up in that way so as he grew up to be pampered <clears throat> gradually like i said earlier this certain level of deprivation uh, is helpful for the formation of character there was uh, a few months ago i read an article in new york times which is based on uh, a movie that was made about parenting parenting styles in in in, in the in india africa versus parenting in the western world so basically now of course these are generalizations but this showed how these children in the western world they have, they have phones and they have tvs and this and that and still often the children are disagreeable yeah, children demanding crying for this they you know if one thing they don't get they cry and they are, they throw a big tantrum and then the same journalist they had traveled somewhere to africa and they were going on a safari and there was this maybe 7 8 year old girl she was also traveling with them on the safari and then when they stopped at a particular place and nobody told that girl to do anything but she herself naturally she started putting the mats over there started cleaning up the things and this is why you telling her this is i have to be useful so rather than asking anything from anyone she was naturally doing so now this is not to essentialize western civilization in a negative way or african to glamorize essential uh, gram and glamorize african civilization the point here is that uh sometimes if children are pampered they can they can become spoiled now it's not always that deprived children become good or pampered children become bad or comfort comfortable children become bad but this is what happened to duryodhan in contrast the pandavas grew up in the forest when they grew up in, in the pandu had been a very powerful king but he had retired to the forest because he was not so interested in worldly gains and when he retired to the forest his his wife also went with him and then his children were growing in the forest and because they were in the forest now the pandavas were innately virtuous they were uh, they had dual births they they were the sons of the gods also mm. which is a whole story i won't go into but they were innately virtuous in terms of that the propensities within them were pious the, they had the we all have a potential for goodness but the propensities are what shape our behavior to significant extent duryodhana's propensity was toward evil whereas the yudhishthir and the pandavas their propensity was towards virtue and not only that as they grew up they had no comfort they had no facilities they had no servants whom they could demand uh, and say give orders to so they grew up to be self sufficient responsible and when they were living in the forest there were many sages around them so they would hear from the sages talk with the sages and by that they also assimilated that culture so they became so both from their previous life's influence i talk about you now when we behave there are three broad factors why do we we understand human nature so three factors shape our behavior one is our past life karma second is our upbringing and third is our association so the past life karma for the pandavas was good the upbringing was also good for duryodhan the from the past life karma it was it was dark and the upbringing was also he was pampered over there because the trash was so attached to him 
So then, what happened thereafter? As they grew up, both of them grew up in their own ways, but life doesn't stay the same. We might have planned a particular trajectory for our life, but in one moment, everything can change. So Duryodhan grew up thinking, oh, I am going to be the, I am the prince, I am the heir apparent, I am going to become the next king. But suddenly there was upheaval. Pandu died untimely. And when he died, then his widow Kunti was told by the sages that you cannot live alone in the forest here. So go back to your family. And in fact, the sages came with her to take her back to the, to, to the kingdom. And when she came back, when they came back, naturally, if you have a big family, any new members come. Everybody gets excited. So these five children were there. Now by this time, the Pandavas had grown up and they were, most of them were, they were, they were teeners, teenagers by this time. So they, give, they had grown up to cultured human beings, cultured, cultured children. And this because they were new, everybody was attracted to them. And not only that, on top of being new, they were also very well behaved, gentle, cultured, kind, courteous. And this was in striking contrast to the way Duryodhana was. If somebody is well behaved, naturally we are attracted to it. But suppose uh, we go to a particular place and then maybe somebody comes to a temple. And then maybe somebody, just the first thing they somebody comes and ask them, give some donation. Hey, what is this? You may not like it. But then you meet somebody else who is just very kind, very polite, maybe gives some prasad, talks nicely, and shows some concern. You say, it's a big. So if you just meet one good or one bad person, that itself affects us. But if you meet two in contrast, then it's highlighted even more. So what happened over here was that they were the citizens and the courtiers were accustomed to Duryodhana's spoiled nature. And in contrast to his behavior, when they saw Yudhishthira's behavior, it was a big difference. So naturally, everybody started getting attracted to whom? Yudhishthira. And when this happened, Duryodhana just couldn't tolerate it. The nature of the human mind is that if we keep getting something regularly, we start thinking that we deserve it. If we just keep getting something regularly, now we may not deserve it. But say if a beggar regularly gets some arms and it doesn't get arms, it's not the beggar deserves arms, the beggar is not doing anything to merit getting the arms, but somebody doesn't give it. Hey, why not giving? Mm. So, although Duryodhan had not done anything to earn that, uh, all that being the center of attention, but he had developed this entitlement mentality. I deserve this. And when he lost this, when he saw it all going away from him, he saw it all going toward Yudhishthira and the Pandavas. This is unbearable. And that's how, he, till, now till this point, his, his propensity for vice had not manifested in a very aggressive way. It was just that he was not a very courteous, he was like arrogant, full of himself kind of person. But he's not harmful, not malevolent. But actually, it is provocation that introduce us, introduces us to us. That means everybody can behave very cordially in ordinary situations. But it's when they're provoked how they behave. That's what shows, not necessarily that shows, uh, that's not necessarily the real person, but that shows a side of them we, we don't see. So because we live in a cultured society, so what happens, even if we have a dark side, even if there's a lot of vice within us, the propensity for vice is strong, still we don't express it. We curtail it, curb it. Rather, you know, we cannot see each other's thoughts. <coughs> and that's a great blessing.
<laughs> if we started seeing each other's thoughts, not a single relationship could be sustained. You think like, you think like this about me? You have this kind of desires? This is what kind this kind of, this kind of person? Horrible. No relationship could be sustained if you started seeing each other's thoughts entirely. So nature has given us that protection. Thoughts might come, desires might come, but how are your actions? So this protector is there, but and so normally even if some dark desires, dark thoughts come up, we keep them curved within us. However, however, when provocation comes, that's the time when this inner curves that are there, they're just shaken off. When provocation comes, we feel threatened. How dare something, something like this happen? So oh, then the dark side within just surfaces. So this is what happened to Duryodhan. That whatever darkness was there within him, it just burst forth. So in his case, Although Yudhishthir was getting the attention, and in a sense Yudhishthir was his competitor. Uh, but what happened? His anger got targeted more towards Yudhishthir's younger brother. Who was that? Bhima. Now Bhima was very powerful. And some people just by their birth, they are physically very impressive. Mm -hmm. So now what happened, now Duryodhan was the oldest among the Kauravas and he was also the heir apparent. So he was respected quite a bit. But when the Pandavas and the Kauravas, they were all, they all kids, they would play. So Bhima, what he would do is, he was so strong. Later on he described that Bhima, when, when the Pandavas got tired, he carried all his four brothers on his body. He was so powerful. So when they were playing in the water, Bhima would just pick up other than throw them away in the water. And like that, Duryodhana was this proud, puffed up person, prince, and Bhima just nonchalantly picked him and threw him away. And nobody had dared to do this to Duryodhana. He said, how dare? Who does he think he is? So all his anger, already the envy was there, and he felt as Bhima is so, Bhima is so arrogant. It's ironic that in when we are, if any of us is disrespected, we feel, we feel annoyed, we feel irritated. But different people react differently when they are disrespected. And often, the people who respect themselves the least, they are the most agitated when others don't respect them. That means when I am internally insecure, that is, and I don't respect myself, mm. then my sense of self-respect, self-esteem, self-worth is very insecure. It's very uh, shaky. And then if somebody outside doesn't respect me, I just can't bear it. So if we respect ourselves, not in an egoistic sense, not that I am so great, but that we respect ourselves, yes, I am, do I am a part of God, I am doing the best that I can, and I have certain gifts, certain limitations. So if we have a basic respect for ourselves, then if others don't respect us, we'll feel paid. But we, it, we won't overreact to it. But to the extent we don't respect ourselves, to that extent, if somebody disrespects us, that agitates us unbearably. So this is what happened to Duryodhan. How dare this Bhima disrespect me like this? And then he was a teenager, Bhima was a teenager. In fact, Bhima was, Duryodhan's age was, Yudhishthir, if he's, Yudhishthir was older, Bhima was, Duryodhan was in between and Bhima was younger, in between the two. So he was older to Bhima. And all of them were in their teens. But while they were in their teens, Bhima, Duryodhan made a whole conspiracy. And he decided this Bhima is intolerable and I am going to eliminate him. Eliminate the children fight, children quarrel. But the vicious streak that was there within him, he just said, I'm going to kill him. 
and he made a whole plan that he arranged for they said oh, let's all go for a picnic and i will arrange the food for you and then he said the bhima loved to eat he's called vrukodara so he would eat hugely in fact when the pandavas would be in the forest or when they would be outside whatever food they would get they would collect some arms whatever food they would get all the food would be divided into two hmm? one half would go to bhima and the remaining half would be divided into five parts the four pandavas and if their mother was traveling with their mother or if their wife draupadi was traveling with them draupadi they would take it so bhima had impressive strength and he had a impressive appetite also so now duryodhan said oh bhima now i have prepared a special food for you so he made a special something like a cake just for bhima and he said i'll personally feed you now at this point I started by talking about how we might be naive. One extreme is naivety; the other is what cynicism, so being cynical. So the Pandavas were largely naive at this time because they had lived with sages, and sages didn't have any malice within them, and they were just kids, so they didn't suspect anything. So Duryodhan said, "I made this cake for you," and Bhima innocently ate it. and he ate it ate it and then he started feeling sleepy now he had put some poison which is like a slow acting poison so first he would put him to sleep and with the poison cake and then he said to everyone let's go and play and they had arranged some game which was far they, they were they had eaten their meal near a river and then he said i'll arrange the game a little away from the river so everybody went away and bhima is lay down and went to sleep and when he went to sleep at that time duryodhan sneaked back and he got a few of his brothers who were who were very much under his influence and they all tied duryodhan duryodhan they tied bhima and unconscious asleep and bound they threw bhima into the river the plan was he would drown and die and oh this is diabolical that you know for a teenager to hold to plan something like this and in a cold blooded way to execute it it's horrifying and this is how we see what vidura had said that there is strong sense of vice within him so abandon him he didn't abandon and then that's why he started manifesting in a horrible way and he as bhima drowned in the river duryodhan looked at his brothers and exulted yes finished some people krishna also talks about this in the bhagavad gita that those who are very ungodly they delight in eliminating their opponents asau maya hata shatrur hanishye cha paranapi I have killed this enemy. I have killed. I'll kill that one also. Just see how clever I am. Ishvaro, I am a bhogi. I am the controller. I am the enjoyer. So he thought this way, and he came back. But in the meanwhile, something else happened. That as Bhima drowned in, he was powerful, and there were in that river there were snakes. So the snakes are water snakes. What are they? What is this? Who's the, what is this being who has come right into us? And they started biting. Now somehow somebody is devoted to the Lord, so the Lord protects those. So Bhima was protected, and by an inconceivable arrangement, the snakes bite. When it bit, the snake's bite was poisonous. Bhima had also been given poison. but these two poisons counteracted each other the so snake bite acted as an antidote and then bima woke up and he woke up and he saw the snakes around him he saw the rope around him yeah, what is going on just shook it and all the ropes broke apart and the ropes broke apart and the snakes were all around him biting him a normally a human being would get paralyzed with fear but bima was the person who didn't know didn't know fear only He had such power, so 
All these snakes were biting and the snake was precious. We just caught the snake by the fang and started whirling him around. And using the snake as a rope, he started beating all the snakes around him. Now none of the snakes had experienced anything like this. The snakes, we just caught the snake in his mouth, uh, the, at the mouth itself. So the snake couldn't burn less. And if this mouth is tied closed, what, what can it do? And then you get and I just and all the snakes just fled. And what kind of being is this? And finally, the snake used him, Bhima just hurled it away also. And when he went away, when all the snakes went away, now they went, the, the river had a deity to it. As it was like the abode of Varuna. So they went to the river god and they said that hey, an intruder has come over here. In space you have this unidentified flying object sometimes come up. So an unidentified floating object has come. <laughs> and then it became an unidentified fighting object. <laughs> so what is this? So then when they described now Varuna knew about the Pandavas, Varuna knew about the God and he knew about, he had that knowledge. So he said, oh, that must, that sounds like Bhima. Some, some people have certain characteristics. He says, this kind of behavior, Bhima, Bhima is only a child, Bhima is capable, so call him here. So then they called Bhima. And when Bhima came there, Bhima was welcomed and honored. He said, oh, Pando, Pando was very dear to us and therefore you are dear to us. The Kuru dynasty is, uh, He's, he's been friends with me and he honored him and he gave him um, was good food to it and they said we have some celestial nectar with us and he said if you drink the celestial nectar your body will become as strong as that an elephant and now even the best of the gods could best of the um, celestials could barely drink like one pot <laughs> and in front of everyone they said, Bhima said, they said, Bhima, you can drink this, become strong. And he picked up one pot, he just drank it. And he finished it and then he picked another pot. And he drank that also. And he picked up a third pot. Like that he drank ten pots. And everybody was stunned. And sometimes in a perverse way, people sometimes drink alcohol. And they say, how much can you drink? So they drink and they drink and then they go crazy after that. But now, now this was such a heavy drink. Now Bhima drank it all and then he started shaking. So then they took him, they offered him a bed. So he drank 10 pots and then he slept for 10 days. And then when he woke up after 10 days, all that celestial nectar had gone into his body and his body had become as tough and strong as hundreds of elephants. So. Then, now he, he said, I want to go back. And he marched back. And in this, now here, all the Pandavas were panicky. Where is our brother gone? He just disappeared from the face of the earth. And it was panic. Ten days he had been missing, several days. So then, they were searching, searching. They couldn't find him anywhere and they didn't know. Sometimes, you know, if a child is lost, you don't know what to do. You cannot even say, is the child dead? Is the child alive? Uh, what do you do? They are all panicky. But just the Pandavas were searching in the place where they had been lost and Bhima just emerged out of the river. And not as Bhima, was looking stronger, more, much more powerful. And then he told everything that had happened. Now, what he had suspected what had happened is, how do I end up in the water? And where are these ropes coming from? He suspected something, but Varuna confirmed it. He said, Duryodhana had done all this. Now Bhima was a fighter and he said, this is outrageous. He said, let's go. He said, he tried to poison me, I'll get back at him. Now, I'm strong also. So Yudhishthir said, no, wait. He said, we don't want a conflict to erupt in uh, the in the kingdom. Now the Pandavas had only recently come back from the forest. And he said that if there is a conflict between us and them, and it comes out in public, we don't know who will support whom. Duryodhan will have his own story. And they were basically like orphan children. 
just come over there and he said let's let's not take this further let's not aggravate it let's try to we will be more vigilant and we'll observe and we'll see how things go so yudhishthir in general was of a pacifist kind of nature don't escalate conflicts just keep, keep it and bhima was not at all in favor of that but because yudhishthir was the eldest among them bhima reluctantly agreed and he is told that oh actually uh he said where are you where have you gone so they came up with the story that yes i they came came up with the story as close to the truth except that they didn't blame duryodhan he said actually I drowned in the water but i had gone to varuna and from there i came back now his physical change was also undeniable he became much more powerful so they didn't hide that he had gone to varuna and duryodhan when he saw bhima back he was initially very scared will be will i be accused but when they saw that the pandavas had no intention of accusing him he said okay at least he felt that immediate danger gone but then when he heard about how much stronger bhima had become his envy became even much more his envy so much much more in the game and basically he had tried a scheme and the whole scheme had backfired on his face rather than his enemy his rival dying his rival had returned stronger than him and he felt thwarted he felt frustrated he felt infuriated and then his wise sometimes when we do something wrong and it doesn't work either we may decide i'll not do the wrong or we may do it more so now which he chose that we will discuss after the break okay so thank you very much hare krishna so we'll have a few questions